Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this week's the Wednesday Guest Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Randy Graham at Central Region Headquarters uh, STI. Um, today, we'll be speaking with Andrew Just, Patrick Guy, the Sioux in Duluth, Ray Wolf contributed, although he won't be speaking, and then John Gagan, the Sioux in Milwaukee. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about this upcoming event across the Central Plains up into the, the Great Lakes region. Um, we are going to use Poll Everywhere. Um, so I think you can see at the bottom of the screen, if you go to pollev.com, rgram 936, or you can text rgram 936 to the number 22333 to participate in the polls. We have a couple of poll questions today during, during the presentation. Um, and, the, the, and that information will pop up when we get to the poll. So we're hoping to go um, an hour or less today, but talk about a few different aspects, um, some of the HREF material, um, and then also some other emerging tools associated with the Arctic air uh, outbreak that's coming up here in the next few days. So go ahead and go to the next slide, Andy. So we're curious how many people have used the HREF probability matched mean or the localized probability matched mean to help enhance your messaging for an event. And we're gonna talk about these tools today and describe what they are and, and a little bit about how you might use them. Okay, we're seeing a pretty good side majority that have not used the probability match mean or localized probability match mean. So we can talk about those um, today and maybe provide a little more background about what they are, how they're calculated and how we can use them. So thanks for responding to that poll. Let's go ahead and move forward, Andy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about different uh, ways that we can look at HREF uh, Ensemble QPF. And I'm gonna just keep it simple and focus just on the 24 hour QPF. You can of course break it down into um, hourly precip rates or six hour amounts or 12 hour amounts. But just for the purposes of illustration in this discussion, I wanted to just kind of focus on the 24 hour QPF because it's really much easier to see the, the differences that, that I'm going to discuss. So this first example is the HREF Ensemble max QPF over a 24 hour period from any of the 10 HREF members. And so this is the max at each grid point from any of the ensemble members. And you can see I've highlighted three areas of interest here. Eastern Nebraska, where there is a, a snow event that was gonna go, this is a, from a couple years ago. Uh, Arkansas into Southern Missouri, where there's a rain event, <clears throat> a potential heavy rain event. And then there's convection in the Gulf of Mexico. And one other thing I wanna point out is if you look at the, the amounts, if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, there's five to seven inch amounts associated with convection, even some in excess of seven inches uh, QPF totals. Then if you look at the heavy rain in Missouri and Arkansas, you see a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of two to three inch values in there, uh, maybe two to three and a half inches. And then in the snow event in Nebraska, um, you see some one and a half to, to two inch amounts associated with that uh, as heavy rain transition into snow event. <clears throat> so that's the max, okay? So let's keep that in mind what those values are, especially when you're looking at Missouri, Arkansas, and the Gulf of Mexico. So let's move forward to the next slide. This is the ensemble mean. And so of course, this is basically the mean of all the different ensemble members at each grid point. And as you know, as you can, you're gonna smooth out the, the maximum values that you saw in, in the max there, and you're gonna get something that's a little more, more spread out, um, and, and, the, and that's gonna cause you some problems potentially um, when you're trying to, to look at the mean. One thing you'll notice is that the values in the Gulf of Mexico are greatly dampened because the uh, difference in the placement of convection or maybe the timing of convection. So those max amounts were really high, you know, in excess of five inches. But when you look at the mean, you know, they're much lower. There's, there's some, you know, one and a half, one and a quarter to one and a half amounts. And there's a few speckles of, 1.5 to two inches in there, but much lower amounts in the mean than what we saw in the max, which is not surprising given the, the differences you might have in, in areas of convection. <clears throat> However, what you will notice is there's a, the mean is larger in Arkansas and Southeast Missouri, but there's more confidence in the timing and location of the precipitation. In that area, the, because you have those, such a good agreement between the different ensemble members, you end up with, with a higher mean than what we see in the Gulf of Mexico. And then similarly uh, in Nebraska, you see the, the, the max amounts of course are washed out a little bit in the mean, you don't see, see nearly as much detail and it's kind of smoothed out. So let's go ahead and move to the next one, Andy. Okay. 
And so here we're going to talk about the probability matched mean. And basically what the probability matched mean does is it tries to retain um, some of the values or some of the peaks that you kind of lose when you create the ensemble mean. So it's trying to maintain some of the higher amounts in the detail that you got in the probability or in the, um, in the, in the individual ensemble members. So, so one thing I wanted to talk about um, is there's, there's, there's some of the challenges with, with the mean that we just looked at is the light QPF cover, covers too large of an area. Um, the local maxima from individual ensemble members are washed out when you go to the mean, and there's not enough local maximums. And so those are very common problems when you're looking at uh, the mean QPF. And I want to point out also that the probability matched mean and the localized probability matched mean are not probabilistic forecasts. They're basically simply a methodology to retain high-end values in detail from individual ensemble members. Now, the way the, the probability matched mean that we're looking at here is calculated is it basically looks and it finds where's the greatest value in the mean in this whole domain that we're looking at. And then it takes basically the maximum QPF from in that domain and puts it where the ensemble mean was greatest. And that's why you see amounts now in Arkansas and Southeast Missouri that are in excess of five inches when the max QPF from any of the individual ensemble members was not that high. So essentially these values that you see in the probability match mean in Arkansas and Missouri were placed there from convection that was in the Gulf of Mexico. And so what it essentially does is it identifies where the mean is the greatest, that's the most confidence and the highest QPF in the mean, and then it takes the highest QPF from the domain and puts it there. And then since it's a 10 member ensemble, then it goes to the 11th highest, it goes up 10 more values. And what's the 11th highest um, value in the, in, the, uh, in the max? And then it puts that in the second highest mean grid point. And then it goes to the 21st and the 31st and it cycles through this all the way. This is problematic, obviously, when you have multiple areas of precipitation like we do in this particular event. So because of that approach, we've essentially taken some of the QPF values from the Gulf of Mexico and put them in Arkansas and Missouri. Um, what you can see that doing the probability match mean in this manner did is it highlighted that area in Nebraska where the heavy snow is going to occur better because the, there was more confidence um, in the location and timing of the precipitation there. Um, and so the values came up in the probability uh, match mean approach. However, we probably created some, some issues where we're gonna have too much QPF now in Arkansas and in Southeast Missouri. Um, the probability matched mean is, is more useful when you have just like a single area of QPF or one area that has high QPF and, and a high mean value. Um, it works out better that way. <clears throat> but the real way around this is if we go to the localized probability matched mean. So let's go ahead to the next slide, Andy. So what the localized probability match mean does, um, and this is not a native HRF product, this is calculated by SPC, this is available on their HRF website, is it restricts the uh, probability match mean search to a local area, in this case, 110 kilometer radius around the grid point. And so now what you can see is those really high QPF values that we saw in the max in the Gulf of Mexico are still in the Gulf of Mexico but we have confidence and you can see the amounts in the Arkansas and Southeast Missouri have come up from what was in the mean, but they're not taking those values from the Gulf of Mexico and dropping them into Missouri or Arkansas. And so now you see values in there that are one and a half to two inches and a few speckles of, of above two inches, even up to three inches in, in parts of Arkansas there. And that's based on doing that same kind of probability uh, matched mean approach that I described where you take the first, the 11th, 21st and drop it into the highest ensemble, second highest uh, ensemble mean, and the third highest ensemble mean grid point in that manner, but you only do it in a 110 kilometer radius around each grid point. So you're not moving precip from one area to the other so much as you're keeping it confined to a local, local area. And then finally, you can see that the detail that shows up in the snow band in Nebraska, where you see higher amounts in a really impressive snow band in kind of south central Nebraska there. And so the localized probability match mean is very useful um, for, for enhanced messaging. <clears throat> it's not necessarily something you're going to do to go and change your grids, but it's a way you can message high-end amounts. And again, this is, can be broke down into six-hour or 12-hour amounts. I'm just doing the 24 because it's kind of dramatic and it's really easy to see. 
um, the, 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 the differences that I described there. So if we go one slide further, Andy, um, this will kind of have the four all together. So we can quickly compare them. In the upper left, we have the max 24-hour QPF. The upper right is the mean. The lower left is the probability matched mean. And the lower right is the localized probability matched mean. And you can see how you go from the max in the upper left to the mean in the upper right and how it really just smooths out um, all those, those higher amounts, of course, because the differences in timing and location and that sort of thing. Then if you look at the probability matching in the lower left, you can see how some of those higher values in the Gulf of Mexico kind of ended up getting placed in Arkansas and Missouri. And then finally, you go to the lower right and you see what's a really good looking forecast based on a localized probability match mean. And the reason we don't have a lot more of these localized probability match mean products is, is they're very computationally expensive to run. Um, I have asked SPC to consider running this for snowfall. Um, they have probability match mean, but they don't have the localized probability match mean at this time. Um, so I think that would be very useful. So what happened in this event? Let's look ahead to, to one more slide. Um, and you can see, unfortunately, the color curves are different, um, which we deal with all the time, but you can see in Nebraska, there was a nice area of one and a half to two inches in south central Nebraska. That heavy band of QPF in Arkansas in southeast Missouri was displaced slightly to the to the south. It didn't get quite as much into southern Missouri um, as the localized probability matched mean had shown, but still you had one and a half to two inches and even some uh, two and a half to three inches, which corresponded very well to that localized probability matched mean forecast. So that's the, the localized probability match mean. And then I thought we would just take a quick look at the current event, and we're going to focus just on one time step for simplicity. Um, so we're going to go to the precipitation drop down menu. And then we go down towards the bottom of that, and there's a 24 hour QPF. So let's go ahead and look at the max. And then if you can step forward to forecast hour 36, Andy. I just wanted to point out, oh, you might have to switch to the zero Z run. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just looking at. I'm like, ah, uh, they don't, it's not fully in yet. Zero Z run's not quite there. It should I just be wanted there to point out this band of heavy precipitation that's in kind of extending from north central Iowa into far eastern Nebraska. And you can see there's some amounts there that are half to three quarters of an inch, even a speck, a little speckle of an inch there. And so that's that's the uh, max. And so let's go to the mean. And, it, and we're going to see a very similar thing, but you're going to see how it kind of gets washed out, um, how the higher values from the individual ensemble members get washed out in the mean. And now you have a quarter to, to half inch maxima spread over a larger area than what we saw in the previous image. Now look at where the highest mean values are in this case. They're all over like the Rocky Mountains, right? Some in the Wasatch and Uinta Mountains in Utah, uh, but a lot of the highest amounts are, are clearly in uh, Colorado. So then if you go to the 24 hour PMM, the probability matched mean, uh, what you'll see is you completely have lost that, resolute, that really high detail band in Iowa and into Eastern Nebraska, but the higher amounts have now been placed in um, Colorado where you have you fixed forcing, their mountains aren't moving, right? So there's high confidence and there's good agreement amongst the ensemble members that there's gonna be heavy QPF in those regions. And so then lastly, real quick, we'll go to the localized probability matched mean, and now it won't move those values from the Midwest to uh, the Rocky Mountains. And you can see that band much more clearly, um, like we saw when we kind of looked at the max values, you can really see that more intense band. Um, and again, you can look at this at a higher, finer time resolutions and can use it for messaging. But I have historically found the localized probability match mean to be a really useful product um, to help with messaging for events and, and that sort of thing and potential, you know, higher end amounts. So that's all I had on the probability match mean um, and uh, localized probability match mean. So any questions or any experience using this that anybody wanted to share, go ahead and raise your hand or type it in the question pane and I can ask the question or unmute. I will display the next uh, the next time step just for um, just for curiosity for people. Yeah, yeah, you get into the real the heavy snow period in, in Wisconsin and the Western yeah. Great Lakes, and you move it forward um, another uh, twelve hours there. 
yeah, there's that max, and then go to the mean, and it really tames it down. You go to the probably match mean, and it's actually not much different from the mean. <laughs> um, but if we go to the LPMM, you see a few pockets at least of enhanced um, of enhanced QPF. <laughs> Yeah, you start to see some of the one to one and a quarter inch values in the UP and up into our center Wisconsin when you look at the localized probability function. Hey, Randy, you, you, you mentioned the, uh, the computational considerations for widespread use of the localized probability match mean. Of course, we see it here on the screen now, but um, you may not be able to provide specifics, but are you able to quantify how much more computationally intensive it is and, and what the what the hurdle is there and whether it's anything we'd eventually be able to overcome to have it more readily available for other platforms or or what what can you speak just a little bit more to that yeah you know i i can't i don't have specifics about like what kind of you know is it a tenfold increase or you know 50 fold increase i don't already have those kind of numbers i just know from talking to spc and um, other modelers like trevor alcott that they say it's 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 far more expensive computationally. I know eventually uh, the hope is that we will have probability match mean and localized probability match mean in the NBM somewhere down the road, but that would be a long time probably down, out down the road for that. It sure it sure makes sense to me when, when when you look at it compared to the other flavors of of, uh, of pulling that information together. That 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 approach conceptually it makes it makes the most sense obviously and hopefully it'll get uh be expanded in the future for and, and we'll be able to overcome some of the issues we're talking about there yeah and, it, and it, it you know really correct some of the challenges you have with the mean as far as you know spreading out the light qpf and dampening down the maximum that sort of thing and it verifies better um than, than, than the mean uh as far as when you start looking at the higher end amounts <clears throat> because you don't you don't just average it out in the mean so yeah, it's definitely a better approach overall, um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do it a little bit more widespread in the future. Yeah, Randy, this is Patrick up in Duluth, and, and you know our forecasters have appreciated, especially in the cold season, for for uh, lake or orographic enhanced or or, or affect uh, uh, snowfalls. But you know, as as Bruce has mentioned too, that there's then the disconnect of of how do I get that into GFD? Um, how do I paint that picture? Uh, that the HREP is showing, you know, with these PMM and especially the LPMM stuff, how do I, how do I get that into GFD? Um, and uh, obviously, there it's just not possible, at least at this point. But boy, let me tell you that that's you get that in there, that's going to be a, a real big bonus for uh, for folks. And uh, we'll see when the MBM can deliver that, or, or somehow <laughs> prior to that, we can we can pull it in from uh, uh, somewhere else. But uh, I know that's that's. A common theme amongst the forecasters is how do I get this in <laughs> to, make, to make my grid show that so uh, yeah <laughs> yeah and it's more intelligent approach than just looking at say like the 90th percentile from the NVM or something like that too because it's the combination of the higher end amounts and the mean yeah and that's the thing that we you know that we've been stressing too is that you know there you know that's a challenge with looking at you know just a plain view that's just the 10th just the 50th just the 90th whatever we all know across the domain the parts will be the 90th and parts will be the fifth and you know so this kind of squares up a little bit better in regards to that in the sense of that you know the 90th percentile snow is not going to happen everywhere it may happen for a little subset and yes. then there'll be a subset that gets the 10th percentile and this wow. kind of gets us a little bit closer to that so uh, at least that way of thinking yeah, absolutely, Patrick. That's very well stated. I would just add to that, Patrick, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, you know, trying to when, when your forecasters recognize that that's the path I want to go down, and it and it represents uh, what what they're seeing diagnostically for for the upcoming forecast. Hopefully, these tools will be part of a broader uh, set of tools that we'll discuss within an established collaborative forecast process, uh, so that so that when QPF snowfall these types of things are done collaboratively that these tools are inherently part of the discussion that leads us to the best solution so that's the long-term goal but uh, we're not quite there yet okay great thanks everyone for for the comments and discussion uh why don't we go ahead and uh, move forward andy uh, and turn it over to you
Yeah, all right. Well, let's jump to the other interesting aspect coming up here that we're pretty well aware of that's going to be coming up is the Arctic air. And so I kind of wanted to discuss a variety, using uh, some of the tools that we talked about last time, um, if you were on the guest speaker series last week, um, we'll kind of review those briefly uh, here again today, um, but also introduce a few others. So the first to introduce, and uh, this, this part's courtesy of Ray Wolf, um, is the CPC Extremes um, tool and Hazards Outlook. And um, they take the, the GEFs reef forecasts and have some bias correction and calibrated probabilities applied to them. And looking at, um, say, like the past 30 year normal in climatology, and they have this um, they have this website produced, and I'm just gonna show it up here, and I will make sure that this is added onto the um, onto our page if it's not already for the uh, on the on the tools for looking more farther out in time. So. Again, we use it's using the calibrated uh, calibrated GEFs, and you can see there's a variety of different um, thresholds that they have on here of int of things that CPC has founded that you know they really got to kind of focus in on for drawing their hazard hazard assessment. And so, like for example, here's the you know the min temperature 15th percentile. This was from yesterday afternoon, which is when they do their uh, you know for their outlooks. And so, you know, this is day day 10. Um, which would be February February 12th or now or day nine, and pretty good probabilities here of some you know you know really cold air coming down through the you know at least spread into a good chunk of at least central region and even spreading out beyond central um, to be less than the 15th um, less than the 15th percentile. So I'm going to go back to this again. I want to know here that they use this for the week two hazards outlook, and so when you see the Week two hazards outlook with with these delineations, you know that this is where that data was coming from. Is this the guess reforecast um, information to help again draw out where these contours are going to be? So, just a kind of really quick overview there again, and thanks to Ray Wolf for this information. So last. Um, Last week we talked about the WPC cluster analysis tool. Um, Jim Seavey can give a great, um, great introduction to this. Um, again, we'll have um, more training coming up on this um, in, in some smaller, some smaller modules here in the in the next few months. But this, the whole concept again behind the cluster analysis is to help give you an understanding of the potential range of outcomes, utilize, um, looking at all the ensemble um, data that's available. And it also helps just give you a little bit, um, peel back that black box, if you will, of the NVM and what what's driving it to do the POP or the QPF or the temperature data. Um, you can get a lot of that out of these, out of this cluster analysis. So I really wanted to pull up some of the cluster analysis. And again, they have a DProg DT available, and I can do that if I clicked on the on the small archive. The default site is um, is this one. And so I'm just looking at the 500 heights and some of the anomaly uh, data with respect to that. Um, and, and you've got four clusters shown, and each cluster has got membership um, associated with it. Um, you can see this cluster one up here. Uh, which has probably one of the mo most deepest troughs um, over the Western Great Lakes region, uh, is predominantly Canadian and ensemble members with 60% of the Canadian ensemble situated in cluster one. If you wanna look at the GEFs ensemble members, a lot of those are confined to cluster two, we're at 50% and cluster three at 27%. And then the European ensemble members are equally spread out amongst clusters two, three, and four. So you can see even here at um, even here at day four, there's a, a decent amount of spread with how how you know both at, about the timing and how far south um, this upper trough in gets into um, the upper Midwest. And the mean at the very bottom, kind of just again as the mean normally does, washes a lot of that out um, and just gives you the single. Um, the single solution. What's interesting, even more so, as we go through time and watch how this trough and evolves, um, there, you know, see cluster one here, uh, which is only at 23%, and cluster four at 13%, start to migrate this trough 
a little bit quicker off to the east. Cluster four is actually suggesting a retrogression. Meanwhile, cluster two is keep it in place. Um, they're at day five. Day six, um, again, you see some of the similar, um, similar activity going on where the clusters one, one and two, <laughs> again, the clusters change membership each time. So you have to take each time step here, day four, day five, day six, independently by itself. But so you've got clusters one and two now being the more progressives, whereas clusters three and four are more retrograde. And, and the mean, of course, is again, washing all of this, um, washing all this out. Yeah, I'm just going to take this day six as a nice, nice example, because last time when we discussed, we were looking kind of at the QPF aspects. Today, let's, time, let's take a look at the temperatures, and um, we'll just do maximum temperatures. And you can see that depending upon how the trough acts over the course of these, the extended period here, will definitely is going to greatly influence what does the maximum temperatures do. Um, if you're um, here along the Lee of the Rockies, you can see that the cluster one has got a little bit more probably with some like downslope component um, happening. And so you get this warmer, warmer uh, solution relative to the rest of the ensemble. Uh, rest of the uh, rest of the ensemble clusters. So like, then in cluster three, um, that's one of your warmer ones <laughs> for if you're in the Ohio Valley up in the Great Lakes. And you can see cluster two is one of your colder ones for in your Great Lakes. So the clusters are a nice way here kind of showing, in fact, these clusters are almost all evenly distributed in terms of total, me total ensemble members per se. And just again, showing a lot of there's a lot of spread happening. Um, there's a general idea that, yeah, we're gonna have some Arctic air around, but where does that Arctic air kind of modulate, move over the course, um, over the next couple of days? So, um, you know, you see the differences again on the max temperatures, and they're also very well evident on the minimum uh, minimum temperatures. And I know, and I've noticed that over the last, you know, several days, this. This whole period here of mid-February has been quite um, <laughs> quite uncertain in terms of there's been a lot of variability in how how this pattern will all um, all shake out. Um, before I move off clusters, because I think that's the last point I wanted to make on um, cluster clusters, I wanted to open this up. Did anybody have any questions um, in the cluster area? Have anybody has anybody been looking at this clusters since we've um, since we last presented about it last week. Andy, could you go, uh, say for the, just that day right there, can you go to uh, just show the 500 millibar pattern again? Sure. So it's also catching my eye is, you know, the very high anomalous heights at the, uh, over Canada and through the top of the domain. And, and, you know, if you're looking at the Arctic Oscillation, and you know the you know, looking at the anomalous high pressures over that, you know that's you know almost another clue as well. Like not just you know your eyes drawn to the low, but also to that pool of anomalous uh, heights across all the clusters, and that you know maybe signaling you know more prolonged potential nature to uh, the Arctic air uh, maybe staying around us. So that was something also kind of you know caught my eye too with these it's not you know, not just but necessarily focusing on the low but boy that pool of pink values uh that are you know going off the, the images um that also has some significance into maybe the longevity of the pattern too mm -hmm. yeah thanks patrick um it's a good point uh we did have a, a comment come in from pat spode and andy it says the number of members turning warmer has been increasing over the past couple of days yeah so yeah, if you go out into uh, so one of the things we can do is we can jump into the um, DProg DT. I wonder if there's a good day that we can pick. Um, we can do day five. Let's do like max temperature, and we'll do a D a D model DT. So I'm going to use the same day five, and so you can look back in time. And again, these clusters are run every it's run every 12 hours. Um, essentially what's that, every 12 hours of the ensemble, and we can go in time. So again, I'm just using one day. Again, each each day ensembles, ensemble clusters change, membership changes, 
So you kind of just have to take them all sort of just as a, I guess, a face value, if you will. Yeah, I do have another comment come in uh, from Katie McGee in Huntsville. She said, the clusters are a cool resource we try to use a lot in our WFO, but we're not always sure we are using them correctly or as the developers intended. It's very helpful to see you walk through utilizing this in your forecast analysis. So thank you. Thanks, oh. Katie. Welcome. All right. Any other questions out there? Otherwise, we'll move on. Not seeing anything right now. All right. So another topic we discussed last week was the extreme forecast index. And since we've been talking about this Arctic uh, cold, it's, why not? Let's, let's take a look and see what it has. Again, the whole idea behind the extreme forecast index here is to really make features stand out that are relative to the model, the model climate. Um, so I think when you look at this, EF, the EFI stuff from the European ensemble that you want to pair this nicely with your um, your clustering because again this is just one member of one ensemble set out of the entire cluster um, and they do this over a five week period centered on the states so you're looking at like late January through the end of the end of February and then the shift of tails the black contours here really talking about the top the top 10% of the ensemble members and where do they fit uh, with respect to um, that model climate, how extreme the event might be. And, and so you'll see in um, here for this event coming up, I just chose one, um, the max T for during this 24 hour period, um, Sunday night and Monday. And there's certainly some areas here that are getting kind of high in that EFI or in that 80 to 90, um, 80 to 90th percent uh, percentile type uh, information. It's not extreme uh, where you'd be up towards the you know, 0.99 or so, but it's still pretty high. And I think when you look at looking at this, um, sometimes I'll, I'll go back to just what the, what does the ensemble, uh, ensemble plume look like just to kind of calibrate myself a bit on this. And you can see on the, the, for Minneapolis anyway, close to near that center of that cold, oh, lowest EFI, and you've got a decent um, a decent range for max T in here. Um, you got anywhere from members that are you know around 10 above or so to you know all the way down to about as cold as minus 10 for a high. Um, so. Where does that fit within the climatology? So go back to your, your um, climate data and the normal, obviously this is gonna be below normal situation. So the normal is 27, but the record low uh, high temperature is only is 19 below. So we're not, we're not at that level. So it's, I think it's why you're not seeing that shift of tails. The black contour is getting really, really high or the, EF, the EFI itself getting all the way down to um, minus one, but um, it's cold, nonetheless, and you're not overly far from that record low high. So, um, any quick questions on the EFI? Not seeing anything yet, Andy. Okay. All right, we'll move on to um, Patrick with some discussion on a, a few other tools. Yeah, sure. Some of these are uh, have been around for uh, a little bit, but our, our good friends at SIPS um, and they, their extended analogs and uh, literally uh, so cold that we had to ask them, hey, can you change that color map? Because uh, basically everyone bottomed out at minus 10. So literally we asked them, Chad Gravelli, yesterday for, uh, hey, can you expand that range a little bit to give us a little more resolution as uh, uh, so we get the now plus minus 15 anomaly on uh, those extended analogs. So obviously, you know, big for us are the SIPS analogs get you past uh, our traditional long-term range into more of the medium range. And really then using this to drive medium range IDSS, looking beyond the typical days one through seven, but you know, what signals can we point to uh, with good confidence to message uh, to our partners in the days, um, you know, seven and beyond. And you know, that's important. And even us for us in the Northland, right? And way up here in Duluth, which is going to be in the absolute heart of, of, of the Arctic air, 
yeah, you know, we're used to cold, but still winter hasn't been overly extreme and still minus 30, minus 40 wind chills still hurt. And uh, that really impacts a lot of outdoor recreation uh, and things like that. So also on the SIPs, just, you know, the, simply looking at, hey, what's the number of analogs that have less than a 30 below wind chill? And so a significant amount and just helping to, to drive our confidence in that way. But literally, it was so cold on the SIPs analogs, we had to ask the developers, can you change the color map? So we'll move to the next slide there, Andy. All right, one uh, thing also that uh, kind of helps us uh, to look at that extending our IDSS beyond, uh, you know, days one through seven, but really pushing that beyond uh, is CFS V2. Obviously, just one ensemble set in itself, but, um, you know, the, the link to it is right there. But being able to have a sense of uh, the temperature and precipitation anomalies out to week four, so we see on the, the larger images, uh, the blues and the greens hanging around through uh, most of uh, the four week period, essentially, that would take us right into uh, early March. And on the right are the 500 millibar anomalies. We, we see them kind of ebb a little bit from uh, our real blues and, and greens, which would be a deeper anomaly. Uh, it looks like we get a little bit of a break there and then, you know, kind of hang around the greens for uh, most part of our region for that kind of on trucking hanging around for us so again it gives us a little more confidence stepping out in, in regards with tying that with the sip and other teleconnections and uh things like that to be able to push our messaging of, of uh, the cold beyond uh week one into week two week three and any bit week four if we have the confidence to be able to step out uh with that so let's step to the next one there andy okay. now we'll, uh, we'll drill down a little deeper uh into the nbm and uh, this is for Eveleth, Minnesota, the home of the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. And uh, we're going to focus for them, at least, on the low temperatures. Uh, so you know, we've noticed up here is, well, there's still a pretty good spread, right? Uh, minus 19 versus minus 34 for Monday night. Minus 13 versus minus 28. Uh, minus 26 versus minus 27 for these nights um, in the, the 75th and the 25th. Uh, 75th to 25th percentiles for temperature. So um, if we go to the next one, uh, to Kansas City, and we can look at the high temperature for Monday, that's a, a tad bit of a spread there of uh, anywhere between 45 and 12 for a high, and that's just the 25th to 75th percentiles. So, you know, we see these large interquartile ranges, and that begs the question of, well, what do you do with that? Um, so uh, we'll open that up uh, to what everyone thinks of should you modify the NBM max tipping temperature for Kansas City? Um, would you modify you know, even like the min T for Eveleth potentially? So we'll give a few minutes to uh, to let that marinate and. Uh, have people respond. So what I'm going to do here is just to help again. If I'll plop the <laughs> I'll plop the presentation back up over here, and so you can see again this the spread and, and that from the MBM. I I did want to make a note. Um, while we're letting people answer in that, that um, going back to the CFS, you know, Patrick, you discussed about the uh, about the anomalously high heights um, in the cluster analysis that we were looking at, and those actually translate nicely into these CFS um, CFS progs here with uh, 500 um, the 500 height anomalies uh, are really showing up there over um, Greenland on westward into the North Arctic there, and then uh, you see the warm bubble associated with those um, in the CFS anomalies. So, no good point, Andy. So, all right, all right. That's, that's interesting, Andy. Right? I mean, we were chatting about this before the uh, we started this. Uh, but there's a couple different schools of thoughts on this, right? Um, when you have those big intercoil tall ranges of either leave it alone or um, in a sense, picking part of the spectrum. Um, and, and so that, uh, it's, it's interesting to see the, the spread in the answers because, you know, we were chatting about it and there's a kind of a 
couple different ways uh, to approach that. Um, and, you know, so we kind of opened it up for more discussion on that. Uh, but I don't know if you had any thoughts, Randy. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get, I'd love to hear, um, hear those both ways. Um, is anybody willing to, to discuss uh, why they felt the way they did? Uh, we did get a comment, Andy and Patrick from Ryan Connolly. It says, I wouldn't modify the max T for Kansas City with such huge spread. But for Minnesota, I probably would, given the spread is smaller and it seems the NBM doesn't go cold enough with pattern changes. The NBM 25th percentile probably fixes the bias correction when going from a warm pattern to a cold one so quickly. Yeah. yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah, interesting awesome. comment, Brian, for sure. Um, I, I would agree with the spread being so large in Kansas City. I think I think it um, it's, it's tough for us. We don't have a good um, hit ratio of, of picking the, the, the winner um, on, on situations like that. Um, and for sure, if you haven't had temperatures that have been this cold in the training period, for example, the bias correction may not always capture a large pattern change. Yeah. Another thing that you bring to mind there, Andy, about picking winners is that absolutely we're not good at it. Um, but we necessarily, have to pick a winner in a sense of we are somewhat restricted in GFE, right? We get we get one value, and and that's it. But um, that doesn't have to necessarily be our message, right? You know, we can you know take this out to uh, 12 versus 45, and you know, there are definitely you know DSS things that we're su supporting in regards to the pandemic that largely have outdoor. Um, largely outdoors and so 12 versus 45 is going to be a little bit of a difference there uh in, in potential impacts there but it's you know it, it's a debate of okay what do we do you know picking a winner in gfb doesn't usually work but we can take the message of you know whether it's for Evelith with low temperatures which are, are not as extreme of a spread but still minus 19 versus minus 30 cores going to feel just a tad different on the skin um and to Kansas City and using that as an opportunity to uh, highlight uncertainty and, and engage with our, our users. And a lot of times these kind of sciencey type posts kind of, you know, you know, people get them and they, they usually get a lot, a lot of play and that it helps to build a reach there. So and this, that's one thing that comes to my mind is, you know, we got one, one grin GFE and that's just where we're at, but that doesn't have to be where our message stops in, in regards to some of these things. Right, that's a great point, Patrick. I mean, we do an extensive amount of messaging outside the grids. The grids aren't uh, at all the only way we message and are really only a small part of it. Uh, Tommy Graffenauer, uh, C in Grand Fork says, power of our forecast is in our messaging, not what is in GFE. We can use these tools to develop our message. So no, as far as grid editing, because when we change, we often change in the wrong direction, especially when uncertainty like this exists. I, I, we agree, Tommy. If you want to add more, just raise your hand and I can unmute you. One thing I was going to add was that I think some of the reason for this spread that you see in the this distribution is a function. If you went back to the cluster analysis and you saw the, how, how the different ensemble clusters are handling the upper pattern um, results in these big, you know, it's you, you just end up with completely different dynamics and how the whole temperature spread is going to, how all the temperatures are going to play out or how the, you know, you can say the same thing on things like UPF and things like that. They see nothing else at this time. Then. All right. So I'll, I'll, uh, I think the last little slide that I got here, and that's just highlighting the WPC Weather and Context tool, which is you know, looking at the NBM and, and you know where are we approaching either record highs, lows, or record low highs and high lows, all those various flavors. And if we see in the table, it's not extreme. If you look at the even just say the low max, right? There's uh, even if you just look at the low min, really not much is lighting up in the table. And in the low max, we just have a few, and I'm showing here the Sundays uh record low high temperatures um where we're approaching that uh, and it's not 
we're not overly extreme, which, which goes to kind of that shift of tails and uh, the extreme forecast index. So yeah, Arctic air, probably going to, you know, be a prolonged pattern potentially through a good uh, chunk of uh, February, but at least this this push isn't like what we saw what in what 2019 or something like that with that you know record-breaking you know burst of, of uh, cold across the region. So while cold and still minus 30, minus 40 wind chills, you know, will frostbite you even if you're used to it in northern Minnesota, just compared to anywhere else. Um, you know, we're not on the extreme extreme end of uh, of the forecast per se. And that's okay. I mean, we don't have to demonstrate an extreme event every time. You know, there's a sense of, yeah, you know, this is uh, something we would anticipate, you know, happening, in, you know, every winter, you know, and we haven't been too extreme uh, thus far with temperatures, but still <laughs> minus 30, minus 40 wind chills for us in the north. They still, they still hurt. There's still people who make bad decisions and uh, go outside uh, ill-prepared into the wilderness and get themselves into a whole lot of trouble. So the messaging, uh, is still there. So even though it's not a record-breaking event, hey, it's still Arctic air and still hurt you pretty pretty easily. And um, you know, we see that unfortunately, you know, in the north, people still make bad decisions, <laughs> uh, even with uh, you know being you know supposedly used to handling some of these temperatures. I'll pass it back to you, Andy. I think that's all I got. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody out there have, has looked at this weather in context uh, context tool. Uh, this is linked off of our page, um, and it's also available comparing your ND, NDFD, um, and you can take a look at that. Again, it's as Patrick was describing, it's not a lot um, of you know records or near records with this upcoming Arctic surge. Um, but like we, he was kind of alluding to, is that we haven't. It's been kind of a warm winter <laughs> thus far, so this is pretty. Uh, th this will probably shock a lot of people's systems, um, given where we've been. So, so I'll let uh, I'll let John um, kind of take this kind of like he did last time. So, Andy, you may need to kind of get out and get back in real quick to the presentation. I've got some stuff in there. Um, this is uh, this is always this has been fun. I'll, I'll just say because I'm doing this on the fly. I this is not pre-prepared. So as you all are talking, I'm kind of taking notes. So okay, what what would I key it on? What are the things that I would include in an AFD? How does how is this thing that we've talked about that can be meaningful and how can we pass it along? Um, and you know what's what's AFD worthy? What's perhaps a GFE edit worthy? And what's perhaps more messaging worthy? So. Uh, as you recall, we started off with talking about the HRF QPF. We talked the max, the min, the probability match mean, and then the local probability and match mean. Um, had some interesting, of course, for myself being up in Wisconsin, I was particularly interested in what we discussed with the QPF, uh, especially as we went from the probability match mean to the local probability and match mean in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Nebraska with the banding potential. Um, and we saw how uh, each of the different types of, of QPF that are available to you show kind of a different viewpoint. Story is all there, but the max shows something different, the mean, how it washes it out. Why does it wash it out? Well, look at your local, your probability of max uh, uh, matched mean, and you can see how some details start to pop out. Uh, and then the local probability of match mean, which has that 110 kilometer radius, makes sometimes even those pop out even more. So you know, the things that come to my mind is banding potential. Uh, so localized heavier snow versus a broader area of more uh, you know, moderate or lighter snow. Uh, another thing we didn't talk about, timing. Timing for this tomorrow is not great. Pretty much during the daytime, so for places further to the west, you know, kind of a morning commute issue for 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 areas in Minnesota and Iowa, uh, and then in Nebraska, and then as you move to the east, it's more of an evening commute. So we got school issues. We got a lot of things that are going to be talking, going to be going through your head when you're looking at that kind of thing, especially with the higher QPF amounts coming in when they are. So again, thinking about, you know, do you have a school email you're going to be writing how does that play a factor in as far as intensity timing precept type all that kind of stuff that the href shows uh but to me for the href qpf how those those little banded little areas of qpf pop out it's not that you're going to trust it for the specific area it's just that the presence of their the presence in that guidance says hey 
this is possible anywhere within this band as this comes through. Don't look for precision. Look for the signal and know that that's a possibility. Uh, so folks who are using, you know, let me jump to maybe the uh, PWPF and, you know, you, you look at your your 90th percentile, you know, that's, you know, not that that's something that's going to be widespread, but that's where you look and see, okay, hey, what's, what is my high end? If I get under a band, what's my PWPF telling me? And that's something you could potentially leverage that, hey, anybody gets under a band, you could be looking at seven, eight, nine inches of snow, depending upon your area. Also, does this match your conceptual model of the event? Does banding match that? Do you see that in, in some of the deterministic models? Do you see a, a strong frontogenetical influence? Do you see, where do you see it? Where is the lift maximized? How does this all marry together? Uh, so when you're thinking about an AFD, does that signal you're seeing from the PMM and the LPMM match what you're seeing from uh, your your the rest of your model sets when it comes to uh, the key features? Do you have a static stability issue? Do you have um, do you have strong frontogenesis in a particular area? Um, so how does that all marry up? Does it marry up? Is there conf is there conflict? So uh, this is a great way to center yourself in details that you can pass along in the AFD that you're going to watch going forward here over the next 12 to 24 hours as this this event unfolds. Uh, then we talked a lot about the Arctic air coming in. Uh, we heard from Andy on the clusters that we we end up with some substantial spread and solutions, especially as we go from days four to five to six. Do we get a progressive trough? Do we get a retrograding? of the of the upper low uh basically that's centered along the you know u.s canadian border um you see those substantial differences in temperatures east of the rockies uh but also we have a pretty steady and we heard this from patrick a pretty steady area of anomalously high heights over central and northern canada which do indicate a potential longevity to the pattern um we could then you know kind of fast forward to the extreme to the extended analogs real quick and those analogs, which are GEFS based, so that that's keep that in mind. They are GEFS based. You know, you both have both a quantity of ensembles that are there, but also an intensity of the cold. As as Patrick came in and said, "Hey, uh, could you could you uh, maybe bump up the uh, uh, you know the um, uh, the color table and, and get some more get some more numbers in there that are usable because it was maxed out at 10." Uh, so we look like we could be an extended period of cold from the 8th to the 14th. Uh, just go back up to the next line to the extreme forecast index, which is the ECMWF. ECMWF this is what Andy talked about. Um, solid signal for cold, but not quite in record ter territory. S plenty cold. Uh, but not necessarily off the charts type situation. But given uh, that we have had a, uh, a fairly mild winter so far, this is the most substantial and most widespread spill of cold air uh, into the lower 48 that we've seen so far this year. So it's going to be a shock to the system. So then we get down to some specifics. Let's talk about the NBM. And we talked about the large interquartile range, which is the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile uh, from Sunday night through Monday night at uh, Eveleth, Minnesota. Uh, which was large, not unusual, really, for a day five, six type forecast. It's not all that unusual, but boy, for Kansas City, uh, did that kind of go bonkers? Um, you've got a, you know, you got a 33 degree interquartile range from the 25th, 75th for Kansas City on Monday. So, you know, the first things that I went to, and I appreciate everybody, you know, putting in their comments about, hey, would I make an edit? Do I do I make an edit? When do I make an edit? Uh, so I appreciate folks chiming in on that. Um, you know. For Eveleth, here's what I wrote down is the deterministic MBM a bit too warm compared to the IQR. Uh, does changing it three to four degrees at days four to five make that much of a difference? So it was going from a low of minus 27 to minus 30, or minus 27 to minus 31, really change your message? Does that change your message at all? Um, you know, I, I, I would argue probably not, uh, but I do appreciate the uh, person who did chime in and I apologize, I forgot your name, uh, but you, you did make a, a really good point about how the NBM deterministic may be a little too influenced by bias correction, and the ensembles are telling you, hey, eyeball something a little bit lower based on the, uh, based on the probabilistic information. Now, Kansas City is interesting for, for a number of reasons. The 33 degree, 25th to 75th range on Monday, you know, the optimist in me says, you know, maybe we try and lean warm for perhaps a socially, socially distanced parade for the Chiefs. Uh, probably not big for the Tampa Bay fans, but hey, that's southern region. We're central region, so maybe a parade for the Chiefs. But we can't really do that, right? You know, point and click is built for determinism. 
predictability and uncertainty is not. So it's okay to say the spread is high in your AFD and, and we're not sure which way it's going to go. But we can key in on those underlying features to focus on a, you know, the things that determine a potential outcome. What would we look for to say, hey, we could trend colder. We're going to watch for these things. Well, if we trend warmer, here's what we're going to watch for. You know, maybe that that uh, that that uh, low pressure is more um, uh, progressive as as some of the clusters show. But if we see the retrograding, you know, we're going to be locked in for cold uh, longer. So that kind of you kind of combine the clusters um, with the the analogs and then the NBM to kind of come up with a, a direction that you want to watch for. And again, we're talking days five, six, seven here uh, when, you, when you're thinking about that. Uh, and then finally, we saw the weather and context tool and this, we kind of went quickly over this, but again, I think it reinforces that we're not looking at a lot of records just yet, um, but something to keep an eye on if the intensity uh, begins to increase any further. Uh, that's a great tool to, to, to keep in mind to see if you are trending upward in the records department uh, on any particular day. Um, so those are the notes I had. Um, this one was fun because we kind of did this in about 45 minutes or so, a little quicker than last week. So I was, I was really, really trying to find some cogent ways to, to type this up. So if there's any clarification from Randy or Andy or Patrick, let me know because uh, we were flying today. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah. One thing I loved your point about, you know, the difference between minus 27 and minus 31. Does that really change your message? And it doesn't, you know, it really doesn't. Um, and that's something we have to keep in mind when we're talking about making those kind of changes. Is it, is it impacting your message in any significant way? And I, I would agree with what you said there, John, that that really doesn't in every case. Andy, I'm sorry, you had something to chime in with? Um, I also wanted to add, because I dug in here to some data, and that NBM, the, the interquartile range for Kansas City is is legit. I was just looking at the European, European Ensemble, and there are six members of the European Ensemble that have a high 40 or higher on Monday, and there are three of the three of those have a high of 50 or higher. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of interesting. Uh, again, all placement of the trough. <laughs> Well, for your socially distanced parade, hopefully the 50, right? Yeah, though I think I heard that that's not that even if it were to happen, it's not going to happen because of. Oh, COVID. I know, but one can hope, right? <laughs> yeah, social distance. <laughs> now, John, I love uh, those points that you made within the AFD, and that's something that we're you know really trying to stress is getting away from this NWP play-by-play -play calling within the AFD, you know, and getting to this next order. Next, second level of intelligence, which is all about predictability and confidence and um, delivering what the model itself can't. I mean, if you want NWP play by play, go to any one number of websites and go look at the model yourself. You know, deliver what those in themselves cannot deliver. And uh, I thought these were just great points. And if anybody else, you know, feel free to chime in here. This, you know, I like I said, I just kind of did this on the fly here. But if anybody else, something spoke to them or, you know, the spirits moves them, please speak up here. This is a great time to have a conversation with things like this. We're busy. It's great to be busy and talk about these things. I would just say that the uh, the last hour was really pretty awesome. Um as, as Randy and Andy and myself and some others have talked about how these real-time discussions will evolve, you know, we'd like to do them a little bit more frequently. It certainly won't be every Wednesday, but uh, with a little more frequency than we've done in the past. And and it and it needs to. I'm preaching to the choir, but it needs to go beyond just the science piece, but how it actually impacts our services. And the discussions that we had on all these topics went right there. You know, is is it a grid issue or is it more of a messaging issue, including what you might put in your AFD? So you know, Pat Spoden's text about the, noting the trends in the clusters and how we might leverage that. Patrick's discussion on the on the spread in the in the mid temperatures with the cold air outbreak and how we might message that. And then John, you 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 went out on a limb there and pulling that together in real time and doing that. That's pretty awesome. I mean, that's not prepared material. You were just collecting thoughts to lead a discussion in real time. So thank you for doing that. I just I just thought this was great and. Uh, I know I learned a few nuggets and uh, one of the main issues we're continuing to wrestle with here is what what warrants grid adjustments, collaborative adju grid adjustments uh, versus those that can be handled absolutely 
um, in, in, in a perfectly acceptable way just via your messaging. And, and more and more we want to go there and the grid adjustments will be done more and more through collaborative means and we're moving toward collaborative forecast processes for QPF and eventually winter. So uh, great discussions. Thank you all for, uh, for contributing to those. Yeah, Bruce, and I'll add, you know, while I've been, you know, a very willing participant here to, to be an SME on these calls, uh, I don't know if I really live up to the E in the SME. I am learning like you all. Um, you know, I'm still uncomfortable with these things, but just getting in there and trying, just getting my hands dirty, trying to get in there, trying to look at these things the best way possible. And each time we've had conversations, I've learned something a little new and something a little different. And it's it's just going to take time. You know, I think everybody needs to give themselves a break and and understand that these things are new. It's a different way of looking at things. Um, it, 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 it goes, uh, uh, it flies in the face of some of our routines. We're used to AWIPS procedures and looking at deterministic models and comparing four deterministic models or whatnot. That's tough. These are, these are tough habits to break. Um, but just, you know, a little bit, little bit by little bit, just get into it. Take a look and see how you can, uh, you know, make, uh, make the, uh, you know, the ends meet here. You know, how can you use this stuff? How can you understand things better? Because the the amount of data that we're getting is only going to grow and we've got to find ways to get control of it. And it's it's these 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 artificial intelligence post process ways of looking at the data that's going to be our way forward. So, you know, even somebody who's been looking at stuff for a couple decades myself. You know, it's you know, give yourself a break, look into it, ask questions. Don't be afraid to send emails. You know, and we'll 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 try and work through all this together. This is fun stuff. This is science in in motion, and um, yeah, it's it's fun. I appreciate being a part of it. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I think that's you know part of the the fun of doing these. Like you, you mentioned, the word fun is that you know none of us have the answer when we're having this discussion, and it is designed to be a discussion and to get input from from other folks and their experiences and that sort of thing. And you know, the bottom line is a lot of this comes down to messaging um, because it's not about solely what's in our grids and we control our message, right? And, and we have many ways, different ways to do that. And when we talk about like the large interquartile spread that we had in the in this event, you know, it's all about how you convey that, that message and provide context to our users um, to provide the most information and, and the, the best information that we can provide. You know, that's the state of the science, right? That's not uh, picking a deterministic number is not necessarily good science in many cases. And um, so in that case, with that large spread, it's really about communicating that. I want to unmute Brian Barshabrook, who's had his hand raised. So go ahead, Brian. Hey, y'all. Uh, thanks for unmuting me here. I, I was just listening to uh, folks bring up, you know, how to apply this to our services, right? And so I thought I'd provide a, a little example. Uh, we had a little flood here a couple of years ago. Um, little in that it was huge. Um, and so right now, what we're looking at in, in a lot of the data that you all have shown, um, not just on an individual day standpoint, but when we're looking out to weeks one, two, three, and four, what all of this is showing now is a trend for cold and not just that, but persistent cold. And what we've been talking about here at Omaha the last week or so is how that dramatically increases our spring flood threat. We've already got a, a pretty good ice jam set up on one of our rivers. And so this sort of prolonged cold streak along with a, uh, you know, a lot of the longer range ensembles predicting several light snows, um, it, at least the potential for that, where you're looking at ensemble means and 90th percentile values of snow for the next two weeks being you know, six to 12 inches in and of itself. And as an individual day-to-day -day event, that's not impressive, but what it's doing is driving our services. So we've got our service hydrologist, he's been sending out uh, his, his now weekly ice jam, uh, spring flood updates. Uh, we've been talking directly with emergency managers and I strongly suspect that as this becomes more and more confident, if that's the road it takes towards cold and additional snow for the month of February, the longer we do that, the greater our flood threat goes. And then it's just a matter of knowing your partners and your emergency management community and how nervous they still are about this type of thing, the information they need 
to have where they might actually start stockpiling some supplies uh, for flood fighting. Uh, I haven't heard that yet, but that's just something looking forward where we can kind of tie these predictions, not just on a daily event, but in the weeks ahead uh, to something meaningful for, for our partners. Great comments, Brian. I really like how you're kind of thinking about extending the messaging out into into you know that that uh, sub seasonal realm, really, um, which is a, an area that's ripe for for me more messaging from us, and we have partners that really need it and want it. So I really like the, the how you laid that out, how you're kind of taking what you're seeing over the next couple of weeks and extrapolating or and, and giving the idea of what the potential could be for later on in the spring. That's awesome. Um, we'd have a question, what's the, an inner, an IQR as shown here? That's the inner quartile range, uh, Jack Settlemeyer. Um, and Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the 25th to the, the 75th. So right now I'm not seeing any other questions or hand raised. We're a little over an hour, which is what we were shooting for today. So thanks very much to everyone that joined us today. I really appreciate the dialogue and the discussion. And we will have an off week next week for the Wednesday Guest Speaker Series, and we'll be back on the 17th. So everyone have a great Wednesday, and we'll talk to you soon. A lot of fun, guys. Thanks. Thank you.